James Sham is an assistant professor of innovation arts and director of our fine arts graduate program. He is an interdisciplinary artist whose research includes themes of translation, performance, social practice, and innovation. Professor Sham's work, which has been internationally exhibited and screened, involves multiple areas of focus from goldfish pigment extraction to artificial intelligence, and he just published a new innovation in the field of photovoltaics. Welcome, James. Thank you. One of the things that's incredibly exciting about your work is its interdisciplinary nature. You've been to Russia. You've been working with, uh, with collaborators in Texas. Uh, what is it uh, about your work that interfaces between art and science? I think historically the uh, overlap of art and science is not something that uh, it's something that's very well established, it's not something that I need to argue for, but throughout history we've gone through periods of time where they've diverged, they've collapsed back together, and they've diverged again. And um, we seem right now to be in one of these times in history where they're converging in very, very exciting ways. Um, in the past, a lot of the collaborations between art and science would look something like um, the scientist asking the artist to come into their lab and aestheticize their work, um, literally asking artists to make their posters look nicer. Um, on the other hand, uh, there was a lot, a lot of a big trend of artists coming into scientists' labs and uh, asking them for, uh, you know, incredible new materials to make artwork with. And these kinds of collaborations weren't exactly rewarding for both sides because they weren't uh, set in a basis of inquiry. And that's something that's changing now because the walls between disciplines um, when it comes to these research fields are dissolving, as long as people keep actively trying to dissolve them. Um, and so that's something that's, that's very new. And so th one of the things that we've been able to accomplish is, is actually folding in a creative kind of problem solving that comes from the world of art um, with um, these new materials, with these new kinds of problems, and actually trying to connect them to social um, justice issues, uh, social um, problems, economic problems, any kind of real world issue. Now also you've got this patent pending on solar paper. Can you tell us about what this is? Yes, um, solar paper is a new invention, uh, the, the world's first solar panel made directly on paper. Um, and it started off because um, I had this idea originally that we wanted to create um, cans of photovoltaic spray paint and give them to kids in Brazil and Venezuela and let them graffiti. And we would track um, where, these, um, uh, where the graffiti would happen and turn them into power generation stations. And the idea was that um, we could make something that served the purpose of research for science. Uh, it would uh, economically use misbehavior as a way to meet, meet a need. And from a, um, an art standpoint, it was transforming a symbol of you know, what is resistance to something else. Um, there were a lot of reasons why that, that project wouldn't happen. Whenever you get an artist into a lab with a new material, they're always going to ask for the uh, least doable idea because they're interested in the ideas that are atypical. They're interested in the ideas that don't already exist in the world. And so th through a series of back and forths, I began to realize what the parameters and limitations both economically, um, uh, physically, um, and chemically uh, what these parameters were for the invention. So over a long period of time we came up with this new dream to make the world's first solar leaf and that is to make these kinds of solar panels that could coexist with nature without deforestation. Currently because of the way solar panels are designed, they're designed off of um, architecture, off of roofing structures. So when you um, bring these um, panels into places that are um, heavily forested, there's no way to really create a grid without um, deforestation. And so um, we had this idea and um, it really seemed like a crazy idea at the time. Um, I went into one laboratory and learned everything I could about um, making microbial cellulose and this was, you know, I knew nothing um, and it took about maybe six months of intensive training for me to get my hands dirty and understand what the possibilities were. Uh, I went to a second laboratory and learned all of the parameters of making these kinds of solar panels that are flexible. Um, in this laboratory, Corgal Laboratories at University of Texas in Austin, before I arrived, they had this thing that potentially could do, make 
um, flexible solar panels, but they hadn't been tested yet. And um, they didn't have a reason to test it um, until an artist came and said, let's try this as an art project. And um, so at first, um, I got a lot of strange looks. Um, a lot of the students and techs looked at me as if this was never going to work. Um, and we had one batch where one device barely worked. And the optimist in me, the artist in me, said, yes, we're going somewhere. Everybody else in the lab said, we've got a fluke. Don't worry about it. This isn't going to work. Um, oddly enough, um, the reason why it wasn't working was we weren't getting the paper smooth enough. And the only way we got the paper smooth enough is when we got an undergraduate art student, a painting student, to come in and start to stretch our, our substrates, our paper, in ways that um, we hadn't previously thought of. At first, she began to stretch it um, similar to the way that you stretch uh, paintings. Um, so, uh, then she started to develop a way that uh, was more akin to stretching drum heads. Um, and through this process, we ended up getting a lot of results. And um, it all took this kind of virtuosic hand in one part of the process. And so at this point, um, the, the invention, solar paper, is in the middle of the patent process uh, where um, we've got a startup company um, in the works um, just about to file. And we'll see what happens from there. Congratulations. I mean, this sounds exciting and revolutionary. Uh, and it brings me to uh, a buzzword that uh, we hear often now, uh, and that is social practice. Mm -hmm. Your work can be described partly as social practice. Can you tell us a bit about what that is and how your work actually exemplifies social practice? Sure. Social practice is a uh, field of art where uh, artists are less interested in what's happening inside of the gallery in terms of making an uh, illustration of something um, or creating an installation um, that depicts a certain kind of reality and instead are interested in using the social fabric as their actual material. Uh, sometimes that means uh, creating interactions that may be controversial in and outside of the gallery. Sometimes it means um, working completely outside of the art world uh, system and making creative interventions you know, in pre-existing situations. You know, um, sometimes this takes the form of political protests, sometimes this takes the form of just you know, performance art. I worked um, in the field of social practice largely as a way to confront my cultural positioning in this country. Um, I felt at the time very much as an outsider. I was a Canadian um, on a visa and um, trying to understand my surroundings. And so I began to use the people in my, in my life um, as, a, as a means of making artwork. Um, after several years of doing this, um, you know, some of these projects were, you know, I created a, a foundation that ran an, an endowment that funded just one muffin in perpetuity at this diner so that every day they would have to reward this muffin, the Sham Foundation muffin, to a recipient of their choosing. And it was a conundrum for the town because every morning they would have to debate who deserves the muffin. I gave them no criteria. Um, and so this is an example of the kinds of projects I was doing before. Um, I began to realize that the partners that you choose to collaborate with in this pr process really determine how far the work goes or where the work exists. And um, coming into a university research atmosphere, I realized that I wanted to play with these researchers. I wanted to um, bring this kind of logic of social practice into the world of innovation. And um, through a series of incredible anecdotes, here we are. Well, you've talked about this to some extent, but I'd love for you to encapsulate it. Um, if I were to say Professor Sham's work impacts the world in the following way, how would you complete that sentence and that thought? That is an incredibly difficult question. Um, it's the kind of question where, regardless of the answer that I give you, I'm probably going to be thinking about it later tonight, you know, when I can't sleep. Um, <laughs> um, I think that my work impacts the world in a way where I'm actively trying to create a space for a new kind of thinking and a new kind of inquiry and problem solving to exist. And that's a space where social concerns, um, and engineering concerns, innovation concerns, creative concerns, art concerns, um, all line up and line up in the same direction. 
um, and that is around inquiry. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity, especially when it comes to technology, to um, rectify a lot of the inequities in society. And sometimes that's not always what the invention does. In fact, if we're realistic, most of the high-tech uh, inventions that, that come out, um, you know, the wealthy always get access to before the people who actually need it. They're, you know, these products are not designed with um, everybody in mind, right? And so a part of that question is a design question. Um, but another part of it is the process and who you're educating, who you're bringing into the picture, right? So um, if you grew up in a school um, or in a home where there was a computer and there was a film editing software, you know, certain things come easy to you. Right? You don't need to make effort to learn them, right? If you didn't grow up with that, when you look at some, somebody making a video artwork, it's magic to you. You know, it's mysterious. And so access to these kinds of tools, especially for the upcoming generation, is crucial. Um, if the next generation, um, regardless of, you know, social economics, regardless of any other factors, if they have access to things like robotics, if they have access to things like, um, you know, experimental, you know, laboratories, uh, they will learn all of these things before we have the chance to teach them, and we'll have to play catch up. And that's my aim when in, in my classroom, and I start to see it because my students pick up skills faster than me a lot of the times, right? And um, I'm playing catch up when it comes to these, you know, programming this little line or, you know, solving this one little problem, you know, and, um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Well, this is a very related question uh, to, to your answer, and that is, let's imagine that it's the end of the semester. Uh, you have just given your, your, your last class, and your class of 75 students are so inspired that they want to go and take what they've learned, take your work to the next level. How would you encourage them to do that, to take that leap, to go beyond you in, in, making, in making their own path? So I'll describe currently what the, what the reality is for somebody like me. Uh, I came into an educational system and an academic world that, um, you know, it wasn't, the rules weren't the way they are now. And um, it, certain kinds of activities were, were harder to come by. So when uh, I describe the kind of collaboration I have, it's largely um, artists working with scientists and researchers. Uh, sometimes there's, uh, you know, uh, somebody from the world of business involved, but rarely at the beginning stages. There's this amorphous collaboration, something happens, and then we try to work with the business world to see what kind of positive social impact can happen out of this invention, right? Um, when I describe that, that sounds like a really kind of open collaboration, but in fact, there's a lot of walls up there with what I described. There's a world of science, there's a world of art, there's a world of entrepreneurship, and they all have different roles in this process, you know? Um, what I can see my students doing and surpassing me at doing is really beginning to solve the world's problems either through prototypes or creative projects um, or through business ideas um, or through just creative social practice, um, performance art, um, in a way that's organic, um, in a way that we couldn't do. You know, um, right now, a student, an undergraduate student, you know, working with their peers in this university probably has a, e might have an easier time you know, uh, working with somebody in the business world, getting, you know, finding a peer in the sciences, finding a peer in the medical school to really re-envision the way that everything happens from the ground up. At this age, their minds are malleable enough, their motivations are open enough that they can meld together and, and do really unique projects. When you get to a level of, um, you know, professionalism, um, everybody has other concerns, and it's a little bit harder to meld everybody's motivations into one kind of collaborative model. So um, the way I see it is if, if the students really run with, with the idea and, and really understand that, that knowledge is not something that 
is kept hidden from them if they make the right collaborations, right? Um, and that um, their ability to impact the world is really um, defined by their ability to articulate their vision, not by their ability to fund it necessarily, because articulation comes before funding. Um, then I think that they have an opportunity to really shift the direction um, in ways that I can envision, in ways that might involve public policy, in ways that might involve culture in a way that I don't understand. Well, Professor Sham, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's been a delight having a chance to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.